they made love and they gave me life, but he never asked her for her hand. She never was his wife. I was just one year old when he walked away and said he didn't love her and even I couldn't make him stay. When I was younger, I really didn't understand. Three generations of households with children and none of them had a man. Having a father was like a delicacy, a fine caviar to me. I thought it was the way it was supposed to be. Never understood this other half in which I lacked. And for a long time, I thought it was just that way if you were black. Because you see, in elementary school, all of the others had a father. It seemed as if it was the brothers that didn't want to be bothered. Until I went to high school and I met Mr. Brown. See, I had a teammate who had a daddy who was around. And he would come to all her games and he would scream her name. But watching him in the distance, it only escalated my pain. Where were you, daddy, when I won MVP? You see, I had strangers there <laughs> clapping for me. And what happened, Daddy? When I graduated high school and when I got baptized, you should have been the first one in the vestibule. But I got to give it to my mother, though. She had the biggest heart. But from the start, she could never do your part. She worked two jobs trying to pay the bills. And what kind of life was that for my mother to live? Because just like you, she missed my games, too. I was busy doing what you were supposed to do. So when that phone call came one March and said that his life was in danger, <laughs> like Tupac, my anger wouldn't let me feel for a stranger. They say I'm wrong and I'm heartless, but all along I was looking for a father. He was gone. <laughs> Where were you, Daddy, when I had my first child? And now that you're gone, who will walk me down the aisle? I wanted to feel a father's love, but you didn't give me that chance. I wasn't as fortunate as Luther, I didn't get the first dance. I wanted to be the apple of your eye, the center of your world. And somehow, some way, I've managed to become everything else I wanted to be in life, except daddy's little girl. <laughs> I wrote that on the eve of my father's funeral. No, it doesn't have any complex literary devices or abstract rhyme schemes. It is just pure, raw emotion that I regurgitated onto a page. Not because I was angry at him. See, he passed when I was an adult, and I had long since forgiven him. First, because he was my father, and it was the right thing to do. But mostly, because by that time, life had taught me that people cannot give you what they do not have, no matter how much you need it. But nevertheless, his death came as such a surprise. I found myself sitting in front of the computer screen and words and emotions that I had never said out loud were spilling from my fingertips into the keyboard. Normally, as an author, when that happens, you feel freed and you feel a release. This time I did not. I was confused. I sat there staring at what I had just constructed as a representation of all that is my life. And I asked one question, why me? How did I become everything that I am? Because see, I grew up in the neighborhood with other kids who were just like me. Some of them were plagued with alcoholism, teenage pregnancy, prison, and yes, a lot of them even died. Why me? I don't have a Superman story. No one swooped in to save the day for us. We didn't find any magic beans that we planted in the backyard that grew into riches. My story is very, very simple. Somewhere in the midst of life, I stumbled upon a defining moment. Sometimes we confuse these moments with our birthrights. Nevertheless, we are not defined by the things we are born into. Instead, who we are is a simple collection of our personal experiences and how we have responded to them. My very first defining moment came the day I picked up this thing, a basketball. Who knew on the day that I decided to pick up a basketball that it would change the course of my life forever? Sixth grade, I tried out for this lunchtime team at a school that I shall remain nameless. I didn't make it, the coach cut me. She said I had a bad attitude. <laughs> she was right. 
But what she didn't realize is that that attitude was covering layers of insecurities and low self-esteem, layers that she never took the time to peel back. Instead, she just threw me away. Luckily for me, seventh grade, we moved to Little Rock. I walked into Dunbar Junior High School. I was five foot 10, 180 pounds. And I don't know if the story really happened like this, but when I walked in, the basketball coach was standing there. He was dressed in all white, and he said, welcome, my child. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe it didn't happen like that, but he was the very first person I met when I walked into the school. And he said, do you play basketball? And I said, no, because see, I remembered what happened last year. But my mother quickly corrected me. She said, yes, she plays. And from that point on, they had some kind of adult pact. He would work with me every single day after school. And her job was to make sure I didn't quit, and my job was to be quiet and do what I was told. And that's what I did. Soon those weekdays turned into Saturday mornings. I would go play basketball with he and his guy friends, and pretty soon I was no longer the mean girl who was trying to fit into life. I was the mean girl who knew how to control the pain. Eventually, I would become MVP of a city championship team at Dunbar Junior High School. I would play basketball, AAU, all across the nation, from Las Vegas to New York. I became MVP of a state championship team at Hall High School, earned a full ride to the University of Arkansas, where we went to a women's Final Four, played professionally in Greece, and I also, when I finished playing, went back to school to get a master's degree. <laughs> Who knew that that one moment could change the course of my life? If I'd have known at that time, maybe I would have been better prepared. Maybe I would have had a better attitude because, see, I wasn't easy to coach by, any, by no means. <laughs> but I'm so grateful for that moment. I'm grateful that I had adults in my life who recognized that that was a moment for me. And so now I want to give you three characteristics of defining moments so that you can recognize them when they come in your life. Any defining moment will open you up to a whole new reality. The little girl that I was in sixth grade who was mad and angry, she, she left. She disappeared the moment I got into seventh grade and I made a team. I became someone completely new. And the person that I had to give up, she, doesn't, she fails in comparison to the person that I became. Second characteristic of a defining moment is it won't really be about you. You see, for a long time, I thought that basketball was about scoring lots of points and winning lots of trophies and rings. Well, over the years, those trophies have collected dust and those rings have lost their shine. But now I am able to provide a life for my daughter that I wouldn't have ever dreamed of having. My mother, at age 53, returned to school at the University of Arkansas she earned a bachelor's degree while she was doing her work study in the women's basketball department. <laughs> she, is now, <laughs> she is now six hours short of a master's degree. So see, basketball, all of those blood, sweat, tears had nothing to do with me. It changed the course of my life, not only for the generation before me, but for those generations that are going to come after me. It helped me rewrite the narrative for my family. The third thing that I'll tell you about a defining moment, it won't be easy. I told you how good basketball is, but what we haven't talked about are the 6 a.m. workouts the charter flights in thunderstorms where you are literally praying with everything inside of you that you're going to make it off of this plane. We haven't talked about the pressure of living up to other people's expectations and what happens when that doesn't happen. We also haven't talked about the damage that losing at a sport can do to your own character and to your own ego. But I tell you what, even in all of the hardships and the things that I went through, it was well worth it because basketball literally changed my life. So I ask you, what are your defining moments? Basketball was my very first one, but I also have a beautiful little girl. And once she came into my life, 
Becoming a mom, it was, I mean, something I never even imagined that I would think about doing, but the person that I gave up to become her mother and to be good at it, <laughs> she fails in comparison to the person I am today. Speaking across the United States to, to students, to motivate students, every time I step into an auditorium, I'm changed, I'm a new person. Also, I had an opportunity to teach third and fourth grade English in Rwanda. You talk about a defining moment. Those students taught me gratitude, they taught me graciousness, they taught me just pure, unfiltered love. This last photo is a picture of my father. It's actually the last picture that he took before he passed away. That's my daughter there with him, and you see he's sitting on this little bed. This was his apartment. He lived in a one-bedroom apartment in Indianapolis, in the Indiana. And I decided that I was going to drive to Indianapolis so that my daughter could meet him for the first time. We got there, <laughs> in came a snowstorm. So what was supposed to be a one-day visit turned into three days, two overnights. But he took the mattress off of that bed and put it on the floor for me and my daughter to sleep on and he slept on the box spring. Two weeks later, he had passed away. But I'm really grateful for him for doing a tiny gesture because he had sacrificed something for me, something that I thought he would never ever in life do. <laughs> so I'll leave you with this quote. <laughs> My birth situations did not determine your destinations. Whether you're born to a prince or you're born to a pauper, it does not guarantee riches and it certainly does not mean a life of poverty. Who we are is a simple collection of life's defining moments and what we have chosen to do with them. I'm gonna leave you guys with 10 names. Sam Mundy, Claudia Rogers, Doris Geyser, Charlie Johnson, Thomas Poole, Trina Tillis, Amber Shirey, Kelly Bunn, Vic Schaefer, and Gary Blair. These are all of the people who coached me over the years. These are the people who dared to peel back all of those layers to see what was underneath. To them, I say thank you. I also have to say thank you to my neighborhood. <laughs> Right here in Little Rock, my neighborhood taught me loyalty. The city of Little Rock has taught me hospitality, and the state of Arkansas has taught me pride. We really hope I've done you guys well. Promise, promise to pay it forward. May all of our lives be filled with those moments, those defining moments that prepare us and point us clearly toward our destinies. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
especially to a young person, any young people that are listening now, knowing that every one of us, regardless of what our circumstances are, we will have a defining moment in our life. Mm -hmm. How do we prepare for that? What are some things that we can do as individuals? What are some things we can do as parents to prepare our children to know that that defining moment is coming and, and how to respond to it? What are your I thoughts? I think on that? the key um, is to not have a headlight mentality. You know, when the headlights on the car, you can only see a short distance in front of you. And whenever it rains, it doesn't matter how bright you put them on, you still can't see, right? And so people who are what I call headlights are people who don't understand that the decisions that they make today are going to affect their lives 10 years down the road. What if sixth grade would have been my defining moment? probably wouldn't be standing here, have no clue. So the key is to understand that every single move that you make in your life is going to have an end consequence. So last question on the same note. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations where maybe we didn't realize that our defining moment had happened five years before. Don't you hate it when that That's, happens? I've, I've been there. Oh, man. That's I a know personal him. question. He lives in England. I should have married him. <laughs> <laughs> Was it the accent? Was it the accent, maybe? <laughs> so how do, we, how, how do we respond to that when we find ourselves in a reflective uh, moment in our life, in a ref reflective period in our life where we look back and we go, man, they either make or break you, sink or swim, as cliche as it sounds. <laughs> you missed out, got to keep moving forward. Moving on. Got to keep moving right on. Right on. Thank you, Celia. You're welcome. <laughs>